Join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Tessier-Levine and Dr. Michael Drake. I know our audience is very interested in your personal journeys, and um, so my first question is, how did you end up as the presidents of these two important and iconic American universities, and what surprised you along the way? Why don't we start with you, Michael? Well, nice to see you, Mary, and uh, you said we've known each other for a long time, so great to, great to see you. And actually known Mark for a long time, too. We met when we were both at UCSF, so that's uh, uh, 20 years ago plus, so it's uh, nice to be back here. Nice to see all of you. By the way, you look great uh, from the stage, so it's a, it's a good thing. And everything. And nice to be back on campus. Campus looks great, and you know, the parts that are different, but then also the parts that are the same, you know, and you can go around a corner, and it's like the decades have melted away, uh, so it's really uh, great to see you here. And now I forgot the, no, I, <laughs> I remember the, the, the yeah. question. Uh, you, you know, uh, I uh, went to college with the concept of becoming a medical doctor and having a practice, kind of a Marcus Welby kind of practice. And, um, and that was really all I knew. I, I mean, I'd known, known doctors that I had gone to see. Um, my father was a medical doctor. I knew uh, parents, friends. So that was kind of a, a career path that I picked as a teenager. And in medical school, I started doing a bit of research for fun, uh, uh, purely, and an interest. And then I met faculty members who let me know about the concept of a career in academic medicine, which I'd not known really existed. And that was intriguing. And I started on that pathway, and I liked it. I, you know, I just had a good time with it and had a great time working with students, working with patients, working with my research. <clears throat> and that sort of led to being involved over time then with the management of the enterprise, just no particular plan, but one step at a time, a committee here or whatever there. And, and then sort of midlife, uh, I, you get phone calls, and I got an interesting phone call that um, asked me if I'd like to broaden my perspective a little bit and be, be the vice president for health affairs for the system. And I said, well, great, I could do that and continue my research and, and patient care uh, and teaching. So I said, great, and then that led to a similar call about going to Irvine, and then honestly, as we were thinking about kind of winding down a similar call um, about going to the Midwest and doing, trying it again at Ohio State, um, none of them were plans. None, I, I didn't apply for any of these jobs, um, uh, wasn't thinking about them. Uh, and then this one, uh, we were actually finishing at Ohio State. It was great. We'd announced that we'd, had, we'd been 15 years as a chancellor or president and, and jobs that have a normal life expectancy of about five or six years. So it's like dog, dog years. You know, you do, do many of them. And, um, and we thought it was time to sort of wind down and then a series of phone calls as happens. And it, and it just seemed like not a time to be on the sidelines. And, uh, the, too much was happening and, um, and a chance to return back home, really. We're from the Bay Area. And, a chance to return back home and then reunite with former colleagues and work forward is sort of how we ended up where we are. But never, never a plan, really, just um, uh, step by step, day by day, trying to do a good job at work and different opportunities came. Well, we're really glad you're back. Well, thank you. <laughs> and Mark? Uh, well, thank you. Maybe before I, I talk about my own career, I just want to say, Mary, it's, it's so great to see you. Thank you for your service. And also, the audience should know that Mary is an amazing interviewer with her work with the Commonwealth Club, so it, we're really thrilled that you could be here for this event. And it's just so um, exciting for me to be together with Michael on stage. As, as Michael said, we were colleagues at UCSF. Uh, I actually have huge um, uh, respect and admiration for the UC system. I got my start um, uh, in the UC system at UCSF for 10 years before I was recruited to Stanford. Um, I got to know Michael uh, a lot more when uh, I became Stanford president about five years ago, going to the AAU meetings, the meetings of our trade organization, the Association of American Universities. Michael was the president uh, for a while. And uh, that's where um, uh, we built on our previous relationship, and, and I, I um, learned just what an extraordinary leader Michael is, wise, thoughtful, visionary, but um, uh, above all, just an extraordinary human being. Um, and makes me so proud that one of our alums uh, then is now the, the head of the UC system. I mean, we are all so proud of you, Michael. Um, yeah. Very kind. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to make clear that the, the uh, sentiment is widely shared. Um, I will share something that normally we don't share, but I don't think it's a state secret, that uh, when Michael announced he was stepping down from uh, the presidency of Ohio State, our board of trustees uh, approached him about joining the board 
And I think the aunt Michael said, uh, could you give me a couple of weeks? During which it was announced he was going to be the <laughs> chancellor of UC, which wouldn't be compatible with this. So, so our loss, their gain, but maybe it's our gain too. So uh, Michael, you know, congratulations. Uh, Mary, my, my story is very similar to what Michael said. I never planned, just to be very clear, I never planned um, to uh, be a university president. Uh, I wanted to be a scientist. Um, I knew from the time I was a teenager that I wanted to be a scientist. I became a, a neuroscientist and started my lab at UCSF. And it was everything that I'd ever wanted. Um, uh, but then over time, a little bit like Michael, uh, you, as we made progress, and I was interested in the problem of brain wiring. How is it that the nerve cells, that you know, billions of nerve cells in the brain make just the right connections to form the neural circuits that underlie everything that the brain does, perception, memory, control of movement, and so forth, consciousness. Uh, we made a lot of progress in identifying the mechanisms through which nerve cells are guided to make connections with the right uh, nerve cells. We identified some of the first molecular mechanisms. And uh, what had really been a fascination with how uh, the world works, with how our nervous system gets assembled, suddenly I realized there might be some useful applications to that, that having un understood how things happen, maybe we could use that information maybe to regrow nerve connections after uh, injury, as, like strokes or spinal cord injuries. And that, uh, as a result, part of my lab started working on application. I became so passionate about that side of things that when I was approached to move to the private sector uh, by Genentech, uh, I decided to take the leap. Um, this was after I'd been on the faculty at UCSF and the faculty at Stanford. Uh, and one of the attractions was I could do both the application but also maintain a research lab. Uh, and I loved it. Uh, but there I discovered one additional thing. I was recruited into an executive position, ended up being the, the chief scientific officer. I discovered that as much as I loved pursuing knowledge, as much as I loved applying knowledge, I derived great fulfillment um, from helping the young scientists there, the brilliant young scientists we could have there at Genentech, be all they could be and more. And that's where I discovered that I enjoyed a leadership position to enable these younger people to fulfill their potential. Um, and I guess that made me a sitting duck when I was um, approached by Rockefeller University to go to Rockefeller. I'd not thought, I thought when I went to the private sector that I'd gone forever. And, Certainly, when I started at Genentech, if you said, eight years from now, you'll be a university president, I would have laughed. I said, who would ever want to do that job? <laughs> but, um, but then I, I learned about uh, 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 those sides of me, and I saw Rockefeller as a small, graduates-only biomedical research university, and it seemed like a great fit to have an even bigger impact than I had um, at Genentech. So I went there thinking um, uh, was with heavy heart, we moved from the West Coast back to the East Coast. Uh, um, and uh, we thought we'd gone forever. I certainly didn't imagine that five years later I would be approached about this job. But by then I'd learned just how much I enjoyed um, uh, reconnecting with students, which I had missed in the, the private sector. And Stanford provided the opportunity to uh, extend my impact further. And so I'd say, um, First, uh, I guess it sounds like Michael, we're both sort of accidental university presidents. It was never planned. Um, uh, but it's been, for me, it's, uh, I just have a deep reverence for uh, deriving knowledge, applying it, training people, and the great institutions that make that possible. So I just feel very privileged to have this opportunity to serve in that role here. Well, thank you. That's such, these are such inspiring answers. We're so fortunate to have these brilliant scientists who found their servant leadership gene in the course of their careers. And it does seem to me that the accidental presidents may be the best. And that kind of leads into my next question. Uh, you so, know, you're, so let me lean into your question, Councilor, sure. before you, <laughs> just to say, but you say accidental, but you, you know, it's not, um, it's, it's hard work. Right, I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, never taking a day off and never taking your eye off the focus and moving. So it was, um, I just wanted to, uh, yep, right, absolutely. just it wasn't, you know, it wasn't something the one backs into, but um, it's sort of making your own luck and making exactly. your own opportunities uh, 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 every day. Yeah, we didn't trip off the sidewalk. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, just to. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> good point, good just, point. I just wanted yeah. to. Yeah, you know, very, and it, it's interesting, good. you're both on the scientific uh, biomedical side of things. Um, at a time when that part of the world is just exploding. And uh, 
and as we're thinking about the fundamental mission of universities in the 21st century, what is your deepest perspective on that? And what is, do you see any fundamental differences between public education and private education with respect to that mission? Um, Mark, you want to start? Well, in terms of the mission of uh, research universities in the, the 21st century, at the highest level, the mission is the same if I look back at Stanford's founding grant, you know, 1891, 130 years ago, which is a, to perform research and advance knowledge for the benefit of humanity and to prepare students for a life of purpose, active citizenship, and leadership. And those fundamental values are, are the same things that drive us today, but the context is different. Um, so in terms of education, uh, the, uh, I actually think that the, the part of, um, I think there's been a, a real um, uh, focus, I think appropriate, that we, we need to prepare students for a profession as well, and that often takes um, precedence, but the, the idea that we need to prepare our students to be real citizens uh, and prepared for active citizenship is something, especially in these very difficult times that are fractious and polarized, that we have to lean into, and in fact, as a part of our long-range vision, that is sort of one of the major themes, uh, uh, preparing uh, citizens and leaders, um, or educating citizens and leaders. In terms of the research, the, the same two prongs of advancing fundamental knowledge, which is, first of all, um, uh, really is about the human spirit. We want to understand, we want to know the world around us, we want to know ourselves. Universities are the places where that knowledge is advanced. And yes, it's the advance of knowledge that often in an unexpected way gives rise to the most transformative applications that can benefit society. So universities have had that, but today I think we recognize that we have to be very intentional about continuing to advance knowledge at a time when their society often says, well, why are you doing that? That just seems so long term. So we have to support that at the same time as we have to even more intentionally apply knowledge and accelerate the application of knowledge. So I'd say the mission is the same, but the context drives us in very specific ways. Um, the, uh, you asked about public and private um, institutions as well, and, and I think uh, we, we, are, we have so many things in common. I think we're, we're just complementary and, and synergistic and symbiotic between the two. Um, and, and certainly for us as a private university, um, uh, one of the, the benefits we have is being able to be nimble, uh, which uh, we have fewer constraints on us from um, our elected authorities. I think our scale, though, can be a disadvantage uh, when it can, uh, not for the research, we can compete with anyone on the research level, but in terms of the number of students that we can access and educate. And certainly one of the things that we're focused on, we'd like to grow our undergraduate class and just as important, we like to extend our educational reach through to students who don't have the benefit of coming here through uh, primarily online, uh, but also other offerings. So uh, I think we're very complementary, um, and we bring a lot of things to the table, and the important thing is for us to work together. Michael? Yeah, I'd, I'd say um, a, a very similar things. Again, I, we um, have a, uh, our, our founding, we founded a little bit earlier, but um, the, uh, we're part of the Land Grant Act of 1862. We founded 1868, and the basic mission at the time was to educate the sons and daughters of normal people. Uh, it's, uh, it was said uh, the sons and daughters of people who of those who toil. Um, uh, the prior, uh, earlier in, in the 19th century, the people who had access to higher education often were the sons of the landed gentry and others, and it's a place to finish you into being a gentleman and. The, concept um, really was to change that a bit and to really educate people to be able to contribute back to their communities. And so we feel a founding responsibility to do things that will uh, lead to an increase in the quality of life for those people who surround us and then broadly the state and then by extension the, the nation and the world. And we think about that every day in one way or another. It really is tied to everything that we, we do. We have two kind of missions. One is to develop, to develop knowledge through research, that's uh, critically important, and then to transmit that knowledge through education to the people who come before us. We, as Mark was saying, we have, you know, have 285,000 students, so we have a lot of students across the system 
100,000 or so of those students would be the first in their family to go to college. 100,000 or so of those students would be Pell eligible students. Uh, the, uh, our incoming class is more than 40% underrepresented minorities. So, so we have a, a real interest in being able to have access um, to a, a, a truly outstanding education and a truly outstanding educational opportunity. And then to make it affordable so that we can uh, do what we can to reach into those places where people are crossing that bridge to the middle class is something that might not have been available otherwise. One of the lines that we've used is that, uh, 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 that intelligence and drive are distributed equally across zip codes, but opportunity is not. And we want to make sure to look into those zip codes where there hasn't been as much opportunity. So that's a, a kind of a central part of our moving forward. I w just to say again about the place that we're, we're, again, Mark and I met first is when we were at UCSF. We were faculty members there. And the, the vibe, as at least the vibe that I felt as a faculty member was that um, there, were, there was a standard that I needed to try to meet every day. And the standard was to be the best in the world at what I and I did, but I felt that that was true for everyone around the table on a daily basis moving forward. So, so the, the drive to really push research forward um, uh, at to the fullest of one's ability, uh, I think is something that's common among the institutions and uh, that makes them really exciting and, and great places to work. You know, California is very fortunate in having Stanford and UC. Um, what special synergies for the world do you think come out of us being located in sort of the same place? Start? Yeah. yeah, let me say, I just heard myself say, a drive to sort of being the best in the world. Let me make that not sound as arrogant. My face doesn't look as arrogant behind the, <laughs> the mask as that sounded yeah. to me when I, when I heard it. It just means to push yourself to, to be the best that you can be. Mm -hmm. And to look at those around in your sphere who are doing really great work and say, that's, that's the, the line that I want to push to. So it's, a, it's actually something that one chases rather than, than something that one, one achieves. Um, and then uh, I think that, um, uh, uh, actually, I forgot what you were saying. Oh, it's I got, Stanford and UC oh, right, right, right. in the same area, yeah. Yes, so, uh, so great thinking about that then and what it is that sort of sets that line that you're driven to. Having uh, uh, a competition um, and kind of regional competition uh, is terrific. Having colleagues is great and having competition is great. I, I think of that as being, I say it's like a guitar string that if it's just lying there, it just kind of flops around, but you put a little tension on the end and you can make music. And, and I think that that, uh, that kind of tension of a partner is really important. And if we, we think about the places in the country, I, another uh, story I used to uh, say, to, in fact, I could do it to this audience now, I, I, I could ask you to picture uh, a picture of the United States, let's say. And then if I said, take your finger, or take two fingers, and put them on a place on that map where there is a center of in innovation, where there's great innovation happening. And you look around and you put your finger on one or another places and that would be great. And then my line is that if you take your finger up, what you'll see is that you put your finger on top of a great university. And that that's gonna be at the heart of that. And generally, if you, those places, wherever you put those fingers, there'd actually be a couple of great universities that form that, form that tension. So it's true certainly for the Bay Area, it would be true for, for Boston, true for um, North Carolina with Duke and, and UNC. So I think that's a, that's a, healthy, a healthy tension. Yeah. I, I think the, I'll just add a few words too because I agree with, with Michael. I, I think in the Bay Area, um, the, uh, first of all, it, it, we are so much more than the sum of our parts by having the you know, UC Berkeley, UCSF, and Stanford, and that's not even extending further to you know, other UCs that are not that far away, Santa Cruz and others. But here in the Bay Area, there are countless collaborations across you know, that triangle. Uh, when I started on my faculty position at, at um, UCSF, within two years, my closest collaborator became someone at UC Berkeley who had actually moved there from Stanford. And I crossed the Bay Bridge you know, a few times a month to, to go collaborate there. Um, so the, the opportunities for collaboration and doing things together have been so important in you're transforming um, uh, and improving the quality of life in the Bay Area, creating opportunities. The biotech industry was created here, a UCSF professor and a Stanford professor, you know, Stan Cohen and Herb Boyer, the, the, um, uh, you know, the company that I ended up going to um, was Genentech, founded by those folks. The, the, um, uh, so the opportunities for collaboration have been there. 
I think what's exciting is that we become more intentional about increasing the interactions. Um, uh, and sometimes it's amongst ourselves during uh, COVID, for example, Sam Hoggood, the, the chancellor of UCSF and I, uh, uh, got together early on uh, by Zoom in, in March and, and realized that there were so many potential synergies between our faculty that we did it in an organized way where our offices did, did um, reached out to faculty to bring them together. That led to some important collaborations uh, on the epidemiology of COVID, for example, um, so an extraordinary uh, study. And with support there, um, as often happens with, with external help as well, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative we provided funding um, uh, for that. The Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, in fact, has created the Biohub, which links our three universities as well with a, a site in Mission Bay in San Francisco. So we're doing more things more intentionally. I think that's the future for us to do that, and we need to do that. Why? Because the problems of the world are just enormous. And we need all of that brain power, all those people coming together um, uh, to, to tackle the world's great problems. I see a special promise in biomedicine because UCSF is a health sciences campus, but many other fields as well. We've you know, been talking with Carol Christ uh, at Berkeley about doing something in the energy and sustainability um, a sphere and, and other possibilities. So I, I think um, uh, huge opportunities, we need to seize them, we need to grow them. And then, of course, uh, there we can have uh, friendly rivalries as well, as, as Michael says, um, uh, and of course, uh, no greater rivalry than uh, the, the um, Stanford Cal you know, big game, uh, which is coming up uh, in a few weeks' time. Uh, but uh, when we do that, we're rivals, yes, but we are also friends and collaborators. Absolutely, yeah. I, I, I always root against Cal a big game, but otherwise, I'm on their side if they're playing anybody else. <laughs> Oh, Mary, maybe I can add one more thing. Yeah. I, I feel so passionate about the importance of the UC system that when I'm asked uh, by politicians in Sacramento, um, uh, including you know, our local representative assembly member, um, what's the single most important thing that Sacramento could do to help Stanford? My answer, and I'm on record, is to provide more support to the UC system. A uh, round of applause for the <laughs> thoughtful. <laughs> We need a strong UC system, and Stanford and the UC system together can go so much further than either could alone. That's amazing. Thanks, guys. Um, we've actually been living through a black swan here the last couple of years, and um, I was just wondering what it was like to lead a university through the pandemic, and what do you think has been the harm, if any, to higher education, and what silver linings have come out of it, particularly in terms of how we deliver education to audiences outside of the immediate campus. Sorry, so the question, I'm, I'm uh, oh, it's, the echo there a little bit. Yeah, so what has it been like to lead through the pandemic? Oh. What are the downsides that might be permanent and are there upsides coming out of it? <clears throat> well, the, you know, the pandemic, uh, leading through the pandemic has not been easy, but what's really, I think, kept certainly me going is um, just the extraordinary spirit of our community um, the, I was just so uh, inspired by how when the pandemic hit and we moved online that to a person, our faculty, our students, our staff came together to support one another through this difficult time to help with the difficult uh, uh, transition. Um, and so that for me has been an inspiration. That's what's kept me going. Um, uh, and, you know, it's not always been easy, of course, but um, we're just so thrilled now that we were able to bring our entire community back to campus starting in September. It is just so joyous. It is so energizing uh, to have everybody uh, together again. Uh, in terms of damage, um, the, uh, COVID is, of course, a, a, a tale of disparities. It's been difficult for everybody, but for some people it's been catastrophic. And we've seen this you know, in our community. Uh, students uh, who, when they go home, there's no private place for them to, to be able to do their online learning. I, I was on a Zoom call with a student, I think a month into the pandemic, and it turns out I finally realized where he was. He was standing in his bathtub with the shower curtain closed because that was the only place for privacy in his house. Yeah. So the, you imagine the, the, the difficulty for some of those students, some of our junior faculty members with kids and no daycare. Um, uh, our, some of our, our young women faculty have been especially hard hit under those circumstances. And for, for those individuals, we've tried to provide support and continue to support them. 
And many of them uh, have been set back, uh, some of our researchers, for example. So uh, we've tried to help our community generally, but we've also tried to attend especially to those the most vulnerable and the most uh, impacted among our students, among our faculty, among our staff. But there are several silver linings. Um, for one, everybody is now fluent in Zoom, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> and uh, so, and our faculty have all discovered that they're capable of online learning, and actually there's some benefits to online learning. Easy to have a guest speaker come in, easy to break the class into small groups for, a, a, a lot of tools for active learning, where you challenge people, can be done more easily in an online setting. So taking those lessons and blending them with the classroom, I think, is an exciting opportunity going forward. And also, our faculty always thought, theoretically, that doing online um, uh, teaching for, to extend our educational reach could be something interesting. They now have a sense of how you could do that, so we're working very intentionally to advance that um, as well. So I, I think, um, especially um, uh, in, in terms of uh, the impact of online education, I think we, have to, we really have to capitalize on those learnings. The other big thing, I, I think, uh, silver lining, if you will, of the pandemic is, not only did our community come together, but we came together with our local and regional community here, whether it's in terms of putting up testing sites and vaccinations to help our local community, or Stanford Live creating offerings online that really spoke to people in our region at a time when people felt isolated and needed that support and, um, and uh, spiritual soccer that can come from, from the arts. By the way, they had the best slogan, uh, I have to, which was, the show must go on line. <laughs> right. So the, the, um, so the, the um, uh, but that and whether it's our, our uh, members of our law faculty helping in uh, with law clinics and so on, um, we built more bridges with our local community. That has been, I think, a wonderful thing. That again, we really can't let that drift away. We're, so we're working hard to build on that further. So I think, and then the third thing is accelerating impact. Our, our faculty pivoted to uh, focus on taking knowledge and apply it rapidly to develop tests, to develop therapies, and so forth. So I think those three things, advancing online learning, um, building br further bridges, deepening our connections with our local and regional community, and accelerating the application of knowledge are, are three things that have come out of the pandemic that we really want to run with now. Michael. Yeah, great. And I, I again, endorse uh, the things that, uh, that Mark said I, a couple of things that I, I, maybe I'll say some things in addition or maybe from a different angle. One of the things that the pandemic uh, illustrated uh, was how important our human connections are and how through our lives uh, uh, and sort of through evolutionary time, we've, it's, it's been important for us to be able to touch each other, to be able to hug each other and um, you know, for us to hold our grandchildren and those kinds of things, our parents. Um, were critically important, and, and one of the things the pandemic did for everybody was separate us from the people who are most important to us, and then from people in our sphere, even, who we um, uh, derived a, a great deal of, of energy from and, and power from. So even, so at home, that was the case. At work, um, it was the case. We all, now we're uh, all at home and, and separated, and uh, we noticed that over, over time. I uh, taught undergraduates until last year, I taught until my last uh, semester uh, in Ohio and haven't started it up here again, but I remember going from my weekly seminar with my undergraduates to then meeting together online for the first time. And actually it was really great to, to see them even in that little space, but I saw also immediately how much they missed seeing each other and it just was quite, uh, quite evident. So that separation has been something that I, I think really affected us. And now being able to be back on campus, I was able to be on campus a week ago and I'm going to visit another in a few days. There's just a great energy from the circumstance of everybody being, being back together and I hope that we can appreciate that as we, as we, as we recognize that. Things we've learned, things that are, are we, we did uh, quickly pivot to online uh, uh, and remote teaching and virtual teaching. We also, about half of our enterprise, like, like Stanford, a little more than half our enterprise is in the health sciences, health, health services arena. And so we, we pivoted really rapidly to uh, virtual care. And I won't ask for HIPAA reasons how many people here have had a, an online visit during the last year, so I'll close my <laughs> eyes as I raise your hand. But, but lots of people have now had at least one visit online or more. And we find that once that's the case, then almost everybody requests visits online for some parts of their care. 
in our circumstance, particularly the mental health services, um, we found a, a, a significant uptick in patient satisfaction when we moved to the virtual space. For um, uh, one of our sons is a, a professor uh, in the East, and he was saying that he doing his uh, office hours, his faculty office hours online, makes it much easier for him, and it seems much easier for students to get up the gumption to come and, and talk to him. So I think that our, our advising and our faculty-student interactions will be, will be better as we have uh, crossed over this, um, uh, this line uh, moving forward. Um, and then I hope that we as a, a, a nation and the world, although it's you know, just stunning to me um, how in the face of the most compelling evidence that we still have resistance, that's a different topic, but we've learned how important public health is and how we, you know, all of our lives, we all grew up, nice to be, by the way, I'm gonna hug you all virtually, nice to be in a room of people I can, I can use references that are based on how old we are and how we grew up without feeling silly about it or that nobody's gonna yeah. know what I mean. But we grew up in an era of, you know, hiding under our desks for bomb threats and, and things and uh, worrying about all that we had to do as a nation to protect ourselves from these great threats from afar. And what we see is the threat that's come and hit us and done the most damage is a microbe and um, killed more people than all you know than, than the wars and all the other things. And what we needed, we spent you know, trillions of dollars on defending ourselves against exploding metal objects, but not nearly enough to uh, defend ourselves against this virus, which has now killed uh, 725,000 Americans in 18. 18 months, so um, uh, I'm hoping that we can, I, I know I, I hope springs eternal, but that we can understand the importance of public health and think about ways we can keep ourselves and the rest of our fellow citizens around the world uh, safe. Yeah, really, thank you guys. That's a very inspiring answer. And both of you touched on the widening inequalities coming out of the pandemic as one of the downsides. And I'm just wondering, um, as you sit here today, what do you think is uh, the new role in higher education in creating a more equitable society, and in particular, if you could comment on the role of legacy status and admissions as, a, as part of the issue or, or part of the solution. And Michael, why don't you start? I was gonna have Mark go first on that one. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, so I, I was an admissions director when I was at UCSF, and we have active admissions at the University of California. Obviously, we had more applicants this year than ever before, about 250,000 for our undergraduate uh, class, so it's really, we're, we're pleased and, and proud of that. And we don't have legacy status as a factor in admissions, and, um, and if you told me, well, gosh, you can have let us legacy status in the factor of admissions, I'd say no, that's not, that's actually inappropriate. Um, we want to be uh, uh, an avenue toward uh, income um, equality. We want to do, we want to be a, a, um, a pathway for people to move forward in the world and to be able to elevate their, their status. And if we have barriers or advantages based on the status you start with, you, 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 uh, you regenerate the past. I mean, you keep, you, you keep those separations. And you actually, you, our, our elite institutions become um, uh, uh, really, um, uh, an op uh, their, their effect on the world is to create more income inequality. They really give those who have better opportunities and make it nearly impossible um, uh, for, those, for those who don't. So, uh, uh, yeah, so I have an opinion on that, and, and the opinion is that we want to look at people, look at their value, look at their promise, and do what we can to uh, reward them for that. We appreciate and love our alumni, uh, and that's great, and, and, and we work with them to do everything we can to have them, we love it when they send their children to our institution, um, but we want to allow people to earn their place with us uh, based on their own uh, drive, their own dreams, uh, their own uh, intelligence, their own focus. Yeah. Mark, what would you say from Stanford's perspective? <clears throat> so the, the first thing is, uh, 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 like Michael, um, I mean, we, we are, uh, we believe it's so important for us to increase access. Um, and uh, the way that we've been doing this, uh, of course, is with deep financial aid. Um, currently, the, uh, for, uh, if a student comes from a family, uh, that earns less than $150,000 a year, tuition is free. Uh, if the family earns less than $75,000 a year, uh, tuition uh, fees and room and board are, are free. So it's a, it's a full ride. And, uh, and above $150,000, we have a sliding scale. Uh, and because of that, um, currently 82% of our students graduate without any debt. Uh, and Very good. <laughs> 
And uh, we've been year in, year out, increasing the fraction of the class uh, that is first generation. So 20% of our undergraduates this year are, are first generation, which is quite a bit more than legacies, us, if you, um, <laughs> since Michael brought that up. Uh, I'm a first generation college student myself, so this is really important to me. It's really meaningful to me, and it's certainly something that we're going to continue working on. Uh, Michael brought up legacy, so maybe I, I, I can address that because um, we do practice legacy uh, at, at Stanford, but maybe I can explain and provide a bit of context. Um, and I should say, this is not something that I'd ever thought about before I became president of Stanford. Uh, I, not legacy myself. Um, uh, my kids didn't go to, uh, they weren't interested in the universities that I went to, um, the, uh, where there wasn't legacy anyway, now that I think of it. Um, the, the, um, uh, and I never thought about it uh, when I was a faculty member or uh, when I went to the private sector or at Rockefeller where there were no undergraduates. So uh, I really only uh, thought about it, I started you know, learning about it um, uh, when I, I came back here five years ago. So let me share a few thoughts. Um, the first thing is the way that Stanford practices legacy is um, I would say, as I understand it in the, you know, you look across the US uh, is what you might call a light touch approach, and that is it operates in an other things being equal situations. You have two candidates who are, you know, are equal. Um, one has parents who went to Princeton, and one has parents who were um, uh, engaged alumni from Stanford. And a little bit of edge will be given to, uh, to that uh, individual. Uh, the majority of legacy applicants um, are not admitted. Um, and uh, those who do, we have very good statistics showing they perform as well or better than the average student at Stanford. There's no compromise. Um, uh, you know, these students have earned um, uh, their, uh, their admission to Stanford in terms of their, um, uh, 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 their uh, accomplishments and, um, uh, and their performance. The, um, so why, ha why consider having legacy? The, the um, one thing that I've learned and I've seen in action uh, since I've been here is that uh, having this intergenerational commitment to Stanford turns out to be beneficial for everybody at Stanford, including our first generation students in helping create school spirit and also providing resources that benefit uh, everybody. So uh, the, the um, uh, at this point, we uh, at Stanford are, are not uh, reconsidering uh, that approach um, uh, with legacy. I hear you know, very um, well what, what Michael has said uh, and the concerns about this, uh, but I am persuaded that it is a, uh, a net benefit to Stanford and does not impede our ability to create opportunity um, for, uh, for students and especially um, the drive that we have to really reach into uh, to students who wouldn't normally think of applying to Stanford. That's one of the problems we have, by the way, that a lot of students who come from uh, underprivileged backgrounds either don't know about us or think, well, I'll never get in, or if I get in, I, can, I won't be able to afford it. And none of that is true, of course. Uh, they can get in, and they can afford it because of our financial aid. Um, so we are working very actively, very intentionally to really try to, to get out to those students and, and encourage them and get them to apply to Stanford because they can come here, they can prosper here. We want to help them be all they can be uh, and more. It is encouraging to hear from both of your schools, your statistics on first uh, person in the family to go to college statistics, that, that's impressive. So uh, another issue that uh, has been front and center in our polarized world is uh, the digital information, misinformation, um, conspiracy theories, you referred to some of it as the pub in the public health challenge, anger, violence. Um, what can top research universities do to step up to help this problem? Maybe I'll, I'll yeah, and, and I'll say, as I did before, I'll, uh, one thing about uh, legacy, just to say, I understand fully, and you, you mentioned I was at um, uh, the Ohio State University for years, and I remember one day walking uh, out of the faculty club, and there was a, a couple celebrating their 60th wedding anniversary, and they'd come to the faculty club for uh, lunch for that, and that was um, great. And they had with them their, and they'd met at the university, and they had with them um, uh, a couple of their children with spouses who had also met at the university a generation before, and then they had also with them their grandchildren who were currently enrolled <laughs> students. 
And it was so I sat down with them for a moment, and I mean, it was just a wonderful family connection through the generations. So a very touching and, and uh, meaningful thing. And then I'll say also that you know my children both went to Stanford, so uh, I, I, I have I, I <laughs> full disclosure. It, uh, yeah, full disclosure. Totally wonderful thing to do. I, I was uh, proud of both of them, though, for being accepted at other similarly competitive schools. Honestly, one so they had a choice, and two so they knew that they weren't here on some you know, that, that, that they'd earn their, their way through. And then three, I'd say that if we, you know, if it's a Stanford versus a Princeton student, that's one thing, I and mean, we have just different discussion. If it's a Stanford versus a first generation single parent student, that's a, another part of the discussion. But I appreciate the, the connections that it provides and our broad interest in being able to, 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 to bring people with us and to us. The, you know, I, I would say about the knowledge and um, all that we see, we're all inundated with uh, this, Knowledge. I got an email from a colleague, a friend uh, uh, from Southern California who was uh, sending an article to me concerned about some of the things that were happening on campus. And, and you know, I had a spare moment, so I actually read, uh, um, against my better judgment, I read the article that he was sending, and it, it was you know, riddled with things that were ridiculous and, and, and obviously not true. And I think we're all uh, completely inundated with that um, uh, these days. Our, we subscribe mainly to the, to the uh, proposition that our job is to create the, uh, the best quality knowledge that we can and to share it as much as we can. Clark Kerr, um, who was um, the president of the University of California um, a half a century uh, ago, a little more, um, had a line of, about free speech on campus. He said that the, our job was to make students safe for speech, not to make speech safe for students. And the concept there is that you try to educate people to be able to, to see what they're, to evaluate the information that's before them and to make reasoned judgments uh, based on that. And we do our best to educate our citizens to um, uh, be able to, to do that. But it's an ongoing, I mean, everyday challenge for, for all of us. And uh, I couldn't agree more with, with Michael. We, we, it's the same challenge that we face and we take the same approach, which is uh, the university uh, is a place first where our scholars will advance knowledge and really try to um, uh, put knowledge on a sound footing and, and uh, uh, deal with misinformation in that way. And secondly, where our students, where we, we feel it's important to um, expose our students to a diversity of views and opinions, to help them learn to think for themselves and decide what their position is on those, because if we don't, we fail them, because they are, when they graduate, they're gonna go into a world where they will be bombarded with information, so our best preparation for them is for us to help open their minds and help prepare them to deal with that uh, welter of information. Good to hear. Um, so turning to other big challenges, uh, from where you sit, uh, what can and should universities do to lead on solutions for hum humanity's most dire problems right now, and particularly climate change and health disparities? Maybe I can, can uh, take a stab at that. So the, the, I, I think universities must uh, play an increasingly active role. I, I mentioned this earlier that we've always, uh, certainly you know, Stanford and most universities focused both on fundamental knowledge and applying it. But we have to be even more intentional about how to apply knowledge uh, more effectively, more rapidly for greater impact. Um, as part of our long range vision, uh, it's one of the pillars, uh, accelerating solutions. So our, 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 our pillars are um, uh, uh, educating citizens and leaders, catalyzing discovering and creativity, uh, accelerating solutions, and then there's a fourth one I'll come to in a second. And under accelerating solutions, we've been uh, creating new kinds of um, uh, infrastructure organizations and resources, accelerators, to help people, uh, our faculty, our researchers, our scholars, who've made a discovery that they think might be useful, uh, an idea for a new therapeutic, for example, uh, in medicine, an idea for a new um, social intervention, maybe in terms of uh, how school boards are organized or some other idea that they have, and they want to bring that to application. In the past, that's happened, but sort of organically. People have decided to, to try to do it uh, by hook or by crook. We want to make it simpler for them, so we, we have, are putting the infrastructure in place for this in medicine. Um, the Innovative Medicines Accelerator for social problem solving, the Stanford Impact Labs, for education, the um, uh, Transforming Learning Accelerator, 
Uh, all of those came out of our, our long-range planning process a few years ago, and we've been implementing them to accelerate uh, impact. And, and that brings to the, me to um, climate and sustainability. We're out of our long-range planning process. Uh, we, we agreed that, that we needed to do something bigger and bolder um, and so uh, we uh, decided uh, to create the first new school at Stanford in 70 years that's focused on climate and sustainability. Um, we announced this, I guess back in May 2020, announced that we were going to be creating the school in, this, in July of this year. We put out the blueprint for the school, how it's going to be organized with fundamental scholarship and departments, some institutes that work on cross-cutting themes of environment, energy, and sustainable societies, and then, yes, an accelerator. Again, resources, infrastructure, uh, experts to help our scholars take their uh, ideas and move them to application more rapidly, more, more nimbly, uh, to scale. Um, so uh, I believe we, we, we have to do more to move to application from idea to impact more rapidly, and we especially need to do it in, uh, in the area of climate and sustainability. You know, I've gotten a number of questions from the audience to follow up on a point you made earlier about making sure that uh, the state schools you see and our state schools get sufficient support. A number of people want to know how that can happen, what they can do, what's, what's the game plan here? <laughs> Michael? <laughs> First, I, you know, all of us know legislators and, um, and in our districts, and I think that as we have conversations with them, it's important to lean them forward. It's actually particularly powerful when you do it. You know, when I speak to them, as I do almost every day, um, they expect me to be advocating for the enterprise because it's um, important, but also they, they expect that that's what I'm supposed to, to do. They care a lot about what they hear from you. It's routinely, I hear from them on what, about something, something someone said to them at an event or a, um, a reception or a fundraiser or a cocktail party. And, and those little stories make a real difference to them. So the hearing, hearing that um, from you would uh, be extraordinarily important, I think. Um, so I, I would just continue to, to, to share that as you believe it with those people who you know who are in elected office. Any other thoughts, Mark? The, um, I stand ready to help Michael whenever um, you think I can be helpful. You know, I've also gotten a number of questions from some of the uh, younger members of our audience about uh, what were the, uh, looking back on it, what were the personality traits that you had to have in order to do what you've done? And then for students that come from a less advantaged background, what particular things do they need to pay attention to in their own development? And, uh, you know, the, the traits and characteristics that you think are really essential in helping people to excel? Well, the, um, I'm, uh, I think when I was listening to Michael talk about his, um, his journey and, and, and how it sounded so close to my own journey, uh, I would say um, a, a few things. First, uh, discover something that you think is important and that excites you, uh, and throw yourself into it. Um, don't worry too much about where it will take you. I worried so much when I was young that if I made this move, that if I made a decision, I thought in inaccurately that if I chose a particular path, that was going to be my path for the rest of my life. Um, and so if you think that, then you worry about every decision. If you think, no, this life is lived in chapters, worry about the next chapter. And for that, uh, choose something that um, excites you, that will make you get up every morning wanting to, to go for it. And yes, work hard, uh, as Michael said. But also um, keep an open mind because over time uh, you may discover that you are doing what you always want to do and you're just going to continue doing that for the rest of your life. Uh, I have some close colleagues, very close friends uh, as scientists for whom all they ever wanted to do was run their lab and they are just so excited 40, 50 years later to be doing that and doing it superbly. Some of them, uh, in fact, the most recent Nobel Prize, our good friend David Julius at, UC at UCSF uh, would fit that category. A uh, colleague, um, uh, uh, Michael and I both had uh, at UCSF. So the, the, uh, that's great, but, um, but equally you may change. Uh, first of all, you may change and the world may change around you. There may be other opportunities that didn't exist before. So keep an open mind and don't hesitate if you get to a point where you say, wow, that would be really exciting to to go for it. I, I, I think if you're 
going to do that and take risks like that. You want it to be a calculated risk. You want to assess things. You don't want to do it on a whim. Uh, but keep an open mind. Um, that's certainly, um, I guess, when I look with hindsight, that sort of describes how I went about doing things, thinking I was going to do one thing forever, but then just being excited and open to opportunity that came along and from time to time taking, seizing that opportunity. And in each case, going for it, to, to Michael's point earlier. And Michael? Yeah, I mean, it's a fascinating question. I pr appreciate that. And, um, you know, if I look, uh, look back on it, um, uh, uh, the, given the 50s, when the 40s, 50s, uh, when some of us were born in the 50s and lived forward, um, if I were to have uh, visualized the pathway forward for what my life might have been, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have been anything that I've done at all because those were all impossible or unimaginable things. And like unimaginable, like I wouldn't have known to even imagine them, and so it was, it was never, um, boy, I have a grand plan uh, uh, to do this. Um, and I'll tell a t tiny story. I, I saw Ken Pitzer, who was the president uh, during a short m moment um, of our, our time, walking up the hill uh, uh, toward Hoover House one afternoon, and, um, and he looked kind of, it was three or four in the afternoon, and he looked, kinda looked out of, I lived in Mayfield House, and he looked kind of happy walking up the hill. And I thought, that looks like a nice job. But, um, <laughs> But I never thought about it more seriously than that. You know, that was, um, uh, I just remember that, that, um, uh, that, that moment. And uh, I'd been president of my high school, and I, there was something that made me think about being president of my high school, uh, as, and then something that made me think about Stanford as a place to be. And so I, I, I had the idea that there were things to do and you could do a good job of things and that that made a difference. Um, so I think that was probably true back to the time that I was a, a child. Um, and, uh, and then uh, very much like, like Marcus said, you, you find something that really excites you and, you and that you can be enthusiastic about and, and pour yourself into and, and, and try to do a good job of it, or, or at it and, and feel like that makes a difference. And then that sort of created the opportunity to, uh, or the platform to then take these other steps forward. And, and the, it really is a series of doors that sort of open for one when you prepare yourself, put yourself into what you're doing enough and prepare yourself to take advantage of opportunity that those doors, I believe, I believe open. And the, the thing that I would say to, um, so the sort of jobs like, like these are held by a, a, a immeasurably small fraction of the enterprise. So it's hard to start wherever you were and say, well, I think I'd like to do that and, and get there. And, and to be honest, if someone said, gee, I want to do that, I'd wonder that they maybe weren't the best suited for it. I, I think that that's, yeah. to, uh, to be honest about that. Um, I think it's better to have it be something that your colleagues believe is the right thing for you to do and that the and opportunities create themselves. And I would say to those who um, start very far outside the sphere, that that uh, uh, plan of uh, really is, again, to, uh, to follow with what Mark said, to really um, apply yourself to something that makes a difference, to, put your best effort into it to enjoy that and to do your best at it is the way, is a good way to move forward with life uh, broadly. These are true words of wisdom. I can feel myself nodding. It's very consistent with my own life experience. Thank you for sharing that. There are a number of questions, and of course that I would reinforce this question. Um, what's happening about gender parity in higher education? Uh, the student bodies are starting to be uh, fairly balanced, but the faculty is a slow go, it seems, at both of your schools. What do you think about that? So in terms of gender parity? Gender, yeah. yeah. The, the, um, so uh, it, first of all, if you look back 30 years, it was really, really shocking to see the numbers um, in terms of the, the difference between male and female representation on, on the faculty. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, increasing um, uh, female representation, our university has been on, uh, uh, on a path for, for many decades now, starting in the 90s, of very intentionally working to, ident you know, to reach out to uh, the best female candidates, to encourage them to apply, to recruit them. And uh, I think in, in the case of, um, of uh, female representation, there's a glass half full story. If you look at the, the percentage of, of women on our faculty, it's been a, a straight line, steady increase um, over time, uh, and uh, it's close to 30% now, I think, across the university. It's different in different 
um, uh, departments and schools. So there are some departments, for example, in the School of Medicine where it's 50% or more um, in engineering. Uh, some departments are lagging behind. So, but it's uh, year in, year out, we see improvement. That's encouraging, not as fast as we want. Uh, we continue to, to focus on it. It's a, it's a major priority. Um, the, the questioner doesn't ask this, but I, I, I mentioned the glass half full because I, I think we have to contrast that with the representation of uh, uh, minorities on our faculty where there isn't uh, uh, a glass uh, half full um, uh, view that um, uh, for the past 15 years, we've gone, I think, from 6% to 7% of our faculty uh, who are, are minorities. Um, and uh, there's only one word for that, and that is unacceptable. Unacceptable. It wasn't because our predecessors weren't focused on this, but it turns out that um, uh, uh, to, uh, to make progress, on, we have to the, the thought was always that we had to do one thing, just reach out to more people or make some faculty billets available. But it turns out that we have to look at the whole, every single step and work intentionally on every single step of identifying, uh, uh, reaching out to candidates, getting them to apply. Um, uh, you know, of course, making sure that um, in, we've removed bias in all of our hiring procedures. Uh, uh, once we uh, make them the offer, recruiting them heavily so they decide to come here and not go somewhere else, and then helping them be successful. And by the way, when they're successful, the sex, sex has to be such that they love it here and they want to stay, and they don't want to then move on to somewhere else, because we found that actually we could recruit people, they get tenure, and then they decide to go somewhere else. So we have to attend to every single piece. We have doubled down in the past several years. Um, and uh, in fact, in the past year, the past 12 months, we've had the greatest success across the university in terms of recruiting uh, minorities. Um, and, uh, the, the, um, uh, and we are very attentive to the fact that we have to make this stick. This has to be, there's been an acceleration. Uh, and we have to make sure that it doesn't drop out, back down again. So, it's something that we have to attend to day in, day out, across the university, all the schools, all the departments. But the good news is that um, everybody understands the importance of it and people are committed to it and we are going at it. So I'm hopeful that we will make progress there, uh, sustained progress. Um, and uh, even as we continue with uh, you know, making sure that we continue to recruit the very best women. Now the, the um, uh, it takes 30 years, 40 years to turn over a university faculty. Mm -hmm. So if you look at percentages today, um, uh, because people stay here for 30, 40 years, right? Um, uh, if you look at percentages, uh, those are the numbers I say, if you look at the percentages of each class every year, the numbers are much better uh, than that. So we're close to 50% in terms of female hiring year in, year out uh, right now. So progress, but we just have to keep at it. We can't let up, it is so important. For us. I'm glad you answered both because that was going to be my next question was the underrepresented uh, groups. So, Michael, what do you think and uh, what has been your experience at Ohio State and at, at UC? Yeah, great. Uh, uh, so, first, again, uh, the, the to, it, it takes 10, 20 years also to develop a faculty member. It, it takes uh, 30, 40 years to turn over the faculty, but if you take an individual person, you have to decide you're going to go to college, decide you're going to go to graduate school, really excel at that, decide that you want to uh, get a faculty position. So it's a long-term uh, proposition. And so we all believe this very much. You really are, are all the way back to high school and trying to get a, a population of people interested in doing these things and continuing to move forward. The, the half full, half empty, uh, I could say is a half full part. I, um, it, it, easier for me to talk about this from my single campus experience than uh, more, more broadly, although I'll say a word about that. But from the single campus experience, I, um, uh, uh, for the last uh, many years, we had events uh, at, uh, at the campus, and we'd have a, a, a retirement uh, dinner where we celebrated people who were leaving their uh, careers, uh, faculty and staff applaud them, that was great. And, and then a, a day or two later, it turned out, we would also have, we did this in the fall, we also have um, uh, uh, some events where we welcomed people who had just gotten tenure, so the um, uh, assistant to associate professor group and where we uh, also welcome people who were new faculty hires to the enterprise. And um, Brenda's here in the audience, you know, the, if you looked at those groups, they looked just entirely different. Now, the level of diversity in the retiree group was, was r rare. 
the level of diversity in the new hires and in the newly tenured faculty was much greater. So we could, we could see it starting, but it takes um, a, long, a long time for that, for that to move forward. We at, uh, and then another thing that we did was we were very intentional about our, our um, uh, and again, I'll use the single campus experience, very intentional about our interest in making sure we diversified the, 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 the student body then as we were moving forward. And, so we had a five-year period, and when we uh, were, we were able to double the number of African American admissions, and um, then increase by 50% um, Hispanic uh, Latinx admissions. We're in the Midwest. We're able to increase by 50% the number of Asian Americans that we admitted. And I would say that we did that at the same time. It was important for us to do that at the same time that we were able to decrease time to degree to increase the graduation rate actually by about 18%. And and, um, and also double NIH funding in that same uh, period of time. So we, we wanted to make a point that we weren't diversifying the enterprise at the expense of science, um, or diversifying the uh, enterprise at the expense of people who could successfully complete the curriculum. We actually were doing better at those things at the end of the time that we began, and we believe that that, that makes for a better and stronger university. And, and then finally, I'll say at our current, just our current, the, the, the most diverse class that the University of California has ever graduated was last spring, um, but the class that's admitted this fall is more diverse than, than that, and we um, have, in fact, uh, two campuses where the majority of the students are from underrepresented backgrounds, and one, an R1 university where, uh, we'll, we'll know in a couple of days, but we were just about 49% underrepresented students at our research one, that's the most intense research university, where we had nearly 50% uh, underrepresented minorities at a research one university, which would, has not happened before in the history of this country. So we're, we're pleased that we're moving forward, but it's, it's a, daily, uh, a daily effort uh, to produce uh, the results that we'll see in the future. You know, I, it, it's been slow, but I have to say this kind of a report is encouraging. It's, uh, it's moving along, and uh, sometimes you have to look back 10 years or 15 years to really realize uh, how much progress has been made. So. Um, a couple of questions about the future of liberal arts. Both schools are very heavy in sciences and technology. We also are strong in liberal arts. Um, where is that curriculum development going? And there was also a couple of questions about whether there's enough diversity of thought allowed on our respective campuses. So maybe you could talk about those two topics. So the, in, in terms of the liberal arts, um, uh, uh, you know, certainly the message that I've <laughs> delivered since I arrived here in my inaugural address and, and since is uh, uh, we do, of course, want to prepare our undergraduate students for a job and a career. We, that, you know, we, we have that responsibility, but even more so, we want to prepare them for a life of change because the world is changing rapidly. Uh, uh, some of the, uh, the jobs of tomorrow don't exist today. Um, and we know, and we have statistics on this, that whereas 50 years ago, people might have, on average, taken, you know, had one or two jobs in their career, today our students have two or three in the first 10 years after they're graduating. Uh, there's a lot of mobility within jobs. And the best way, uh, in my view, to prepare yourself for a lifetime of change is by having a broad education, by exploring broadly in diverse fields um, so that you are prepared for uh, a life in which you're gonna have to encounter new opportunities and new ideas. I think it is the best preparation for life of change. That's why we think a liberal education where the students uh, have to explore broadly is so important. We have um, requirements uh, uh, for that as uh, you know, for our undergraduates they have to take to get a broad education. Uh, as important, perhaps even more important, is um, uh, you know, what we put in place this year for the first time, we piloted it last year, which is a new curriculum for our undergraduate students um, uh, focused on uh, civic, um, liberal, and global education. The acronym is COLLEGE. Uh, it's a course that the, uh, all um, uh, first-year students have to take. Uh, we're, we're building it up over time. And it's really to, to um, get our students to explore ideas um, and to learn how to uh, uh, tackle difficult issues in the classroom, things that they might otherwise be discussing you know, in the pages of the Stanford Daily. Um, we think it's important for them, with the help of brilliant faculty, to tackle some of the major issues, like issues of free speech uh, and so forth. Um, so I'm very excited that this came out of our long-range planning process. The faculty to a person said, we, we want a shared 
experience for our undergraduates. Um, this is a departure for Stanford. We haven't had a core curriculum, so think of this as a yeah. core curriculum, and it's focused on citizenship and being uh, a citizen. So I'm so excited, and it's going, and the, the, uh, so far, the surveys of the students have been just phenomenal. The students really love this. This feeds into the, the, the second part of your question, which is um, the, uh, uh, about diversity of thought uh, on campus. Uh, I actually believe that um, uh, as a university, we have a responsibility to provide a forum where diversity of opinions and ideas and views and perspectives um, can be expressed and debated. Um, uh, providing, you know, confronting a diversity of views is essential to our um, research mission of seeking the truth, to explore the truth and, ident and, and, and uh, find the truth. You have to be willing, uh, many, in many, many cases, to consider ideas that might seem weird or bizarre or even uh, objectionable at the time. Uh, there are examples of this from physics to history, right? In all fields, um, getting at the truth requires an openness to consider alternative points of view. So we fail if we don't provide an era, uh, a forum where people can explore a diversity of views. Um, and we also fail our students if we don't expose them to that to prepare them for a life uh, in which they're gonna be confronted with a diversity of views. So as a university, it's important for us to, to make sure that we provide that, that uh, environment, that forum. Uh, it's also important for us to make sure that uh, among our, our, our faculty and our offerings that we have diverse perspectives that are represented. Um, and so, you know, at Stanford, we're, we're fortunate that we have um, uh, a, a diversity of views expressed. You know, if you look at our different departments and you take the various institutes that we have, including the Hoover Institute on the one hand um, and uh, other institutes on the other, that we have a diversity of views that are being researched, debated, explored to be true to our mission of uh, broadly considering uh, views and perspectives to advance the search for the truth um, and uh, to prepare our students. Uh, then I would say all, all, uh, very much the same. You know, we have a very large community, as you mentioned. We're 285,000 students, 225,000 faculty and staff. And, uh, and so we'd have uh, 500,000 uh, opinions uh, there. <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, you, maybe you chuckled, but I find it's something, oh, never mind. Uh, and so we have within that range of people uh, the, the wide range of opinions and perspectives. And um, some are louder, some are more prominent, some are more featured. Our, we believe that our job really is to try to be a platform, um, a place, a marketplace for ideas, and that it's critical when you have those ideas that there's no particular type of thought or speech or anything else that is uh, um, uh, celebrated and protected uh, versus, versus others. We at the same time have uh, a great tension um, it, it, to be a welcoming and um, uh, a safe place for people to be, a place where you're not, um, where you can feel at home and grow. And there's a, there's a challenge there um, to, to making sure that we can balance those, those things. And I will say that we work very actively, very uh, heavily to try to make sure that there's a, a, a fair balance. So we, um, uh, I believe that, that every student, every, every, every person who works in our university uh, deserves the full range of freedoms that are available to all of us. And that it's uh, honestly my responsibility to protect evil, every single person's right to do those things. And, and we do our best every day to make that uh, the case. Sometimes there are people who have incompatible, divergent, and, and uh, antagonistic views. And, and we do what we can to manage those in a fair and effective and safe way. And I would say that if we think of the number of times that we have um, uh, 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 differences of opinion or conflict or controversial or unpopular views shared, it's, it's every day. Uh, every once in a while, there's a particular problem that we have to focus on, but there'll, there'll be thousands and thousands of times that, that no one hears about when those things were managed appropriately, and that's the normal uh, uh, daily business of the internet. That's a really good point to make. Yeah, and yeah, Mark. Mary, maybe I could just you know yeah. uh, amplify further and say the the you know what we we try to do as a university, just like Michael described, is is model a community where people can uh, engage in debate, even heated or vigorous debate but do so while respecting the dignity of the other person they're talking to and not try to silence their speech. 
we try on this college course, uh, the new curriculum, I think is a place where we're going to help our students learn how to disagree without being disagreeable. Um, and I think that sort of is, is sort of the, the general mantra. Yeah, the whole country needs that. No, absolutely. Um, turning to a, another topic that's been in the news, um, what is the role of sports in top research universities? And Mark, if you wanted to talk a little bit about Stanford's decision to cut some sports and then the reversal in light of reactions. Yeah, yeah. well, well sp <laughs> <laughs> Michael, of course, at Ohio State, uh, you know, it's a, a powerhouse as, as well, and very interested to hear your, your take oh, and on UC that. Well, and UC's got yeah, the, the um, and, and the UC's. The, the, um, uh, so sports, uh, I think, uh, uh, are such uh, an important part of the life of our university. Um, our uh, student athletes are extraordinary individuals. Um, they, they all are as accomplished academically as our other students. Uh, in addition, they have this special gift. Stanford athletics, it just blows my mind, and I, I just have to, I think everybody here knows that we um, uh, we have uh, uh, sports that are really performed at the Olympic level, quite literally, um, and perhaps that's best captured by the fact that at the Olympics that just occurred, uh, for the se second Olympics in a row, Stanford students and alumni won more medals than did my home country of Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Which fills me with Stanford pride and Canadian embarrassment at the same time. <laughs> So the, the, I mean, these are, and, and these students are extraordinary, they're extraordinary role models. They are, uh, I just hosted a, um, uh, an event, a reception for uh, our, our Olympians and, and their families, and they are all so nice. They are humble champions. Uh, you know, they, they're also, so they, they're sort of sheepish about showing their gold medal and, <laughs> and so on, and they, they all think that I'm a really important person and want my autograph, and I'm saying, you got it wrong, I want your autograph, <laughs> yeah. you know. The, the, um, so they're just remarkable individuals. They add so much to our student body. Um, and so it was one of the greatest sources of, of joy and pride when I came here and got to know those students and interact with them uh, as well. Um, the, so I, I really believe in um, uh, our athletic program, in our student athletes, and we are committed to it. Uh, Mary, you brought up the fact that, um, you know, I guess in July of 2020, we announced that we were going to discontinue um, 11 of our 36 varsity sports. Um, the, uh, the decision was entirely financial at the time. Uh, so the, the, we have a problem of sustaining our um, uh, athletic programs financially. Uh, it's a, this is, we're in a world where there's sort of an arms race in terms of how much colleges are spending uh, on athletics and a lot of it driven by, by colleges where um, uh, you have um, uh, uh, much bigger, um, a much bigger fan base or active fan base that can fill stadiums, generate revenues. Um, we both had 36 varsity sports, uh, Ohio State and, and Stanford, but I think the Ohio State budget uh, was probably about 60, north of 60 million dollars more a year. Um, the, the, um, so we had a financial issue, and in July of 2020, in the midst of COVID, where we were all happy that it looked like the markets may not crater, um, the most we hoped for is that they wouldn't crater over the next 12 months. And so we, we looked at that. Um, for years now, we've been running a structural deficit in athletics. We didn't see how we could solve the problem, and we felt we had to bite the bullet. Um, two things happened over the next months. Uh, one is not only did the markets not crater, they actually did better than I think anybody could reasonably have expected back in, yeah. in July of 2020. I mean, it's just extraordinary, which you know uh, made uh, endowment returns for for our athletics program, where they're, they, which is endowed, uh, and the university as a whole, that much better. That was part one, and part two, our alumni rallied um, uh, to save the sports, and I give a lot of credit to a group called 36 Strong uh, that approached us, um, uh, and some of our trustees who, who uh, made the introductions um, to me, uh, came with a real spirit of uh, constructive collaboration partnership and showed how we could improve our fundraising and so with the combination of increased resources from the markets and the 
these new fundraising opportunities that they made evident and their constructive attitude uh, made uh, me argue to our trustees that we should reverse course back in May and reinstate the sports. Uh, I think we all wish that we hadn't gone through the cuts and the reinstatement, um, but you were talking about silver linings er earlier. The, it, one silver lining is I think it's brought the community together um, our, uh, uh, the, the alumni from those sports and all the friends of Stanford sports, along with us to say, this is something very precious. Let's make the, continue to make this a huge success. So I'm very, very grateful to um, our alumni uh, for playing a really important role there. Thanks, Mark. Anything you want to add on sports? <laughs> uh, uh, just uh, uh, to say that I think that uh, uh, Khalidja, you know, I had a, I was chaired the NC2A for a bit really focused on the uh, power of athletics in collegiate life. One of uh, our, our sons uh, uh, was an athlete here at Stanford in track and cross country, and uh, we appreciate that. And in fact, his decision to come to Stanford versus the other places was based largely on the quality of the team. Um, and so that it was, it was very important. My father went to college for the uh, to play football, and I want to say he didn't. He, he, he went to college because he wanted to play football and there was no other place for him to be able to play football. Um, uh, but then found a career, as I mentioned, in medicine later on. And so I still have his photograph um, in my office along with his 1933 National Championship trophy. And I think of that inspiration of really your mind and body being tied together. I will say a word more about my uh, dad who practiced medicine until he was 99. and. Um, I, which I uh, appreciated. I saw him the day before he passed away, and he was, um, uh, the day before that, I know, had been a little tired when he took his normal lap around the courtyard they lived in because he exercised and worked out every day all the way until the end. And so I grew up in a family where that was something that was seen, the, the two together were seen as something to celebrate. We got to see it. Um, one of our sons actually r ran track here. The other son did uh, color and play-by-play -play for KCSU. Um, uh, for the football team, and so I was uh, looking at sports from a, a different, um, uh, different point of view. And I, I think it's really one of the wonderful parts of uh, uh, collegiate life, and supporting those student athletes has been terrific. Getting to know them, the Olympians who we've gotten to meet, the world champions we've gotten to meet, also the um, number 27 on the lacrosse team that nobody knows about, but who's dedicated in practice. I mean, it really is a, a great life lessons, great uh, human connections between the athletes themselves and coaches. So we're, I'm, I'm a big supporter of collegiate athletics as a part of the fabric of college life. And one of the things that makes our res residential colleges such a joy. Well, thank you. You know, uh, the time has just flown by, but we are at, out of time. Um, I could sit here and ask questions for a lot longer, and I'm sure a lot of you would enjoy hearing it, but I am so grateful for your wisdom and your uh, insight into these important issues. And uh, I think, I know the audience joins me in thanking you, but also saying we're very fortunate to have our universities in good hands. So thank you so much. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.